Welcome to the Area of Effect Gaming channel. I hope this video earns a like and your subscription. I encourage comments so that I can improve the channel. Today we will be covering City Skylines 2. So let's get started. Alright everybody, we're on episode 5, feature highlights, uh, City Services. Let's watch. Successful city building in City Skylines 2 is all about people anticipating their needs and desires, ensuring they feel safe, and actually keeping them safe, understanding what annoys and delights them, and doing what it takes to give them healthy, happy lives from beginning to end. How? City services. You'll build clinics and hospitals to deliver health care, plus the ambulance service people need in life or death situations. Oh yeah, sometimes it will be a death situation, so you'll add death care services that transport people to the city's crematoriums and cemeteries. Now, I want to point out, um, they changed the buildings um, with City Skylines 2 so that some buildings like the crematoriums and stuff and the, all the city services uh, will have the ability to add additional sub-buildings that, that have to attach to the main building. And then there's also upgrades for the primary building. And that'll increase like bus line capacity, you know, graveyard incineration space, uh, you know, stuff like that. So that's an important thing to note as they go through this. We'll set up schools for kids of all ages, plus colleges and universities. After all, education fosters social advancement. Life still might take a turn for the worse for some people. When it does, you'll want the safety net of a welfare office. One thing that improves everyone's well-being, no matter what's going on in life, is time outdoors. You'll create parks, plazas, attractions, and landmarks that make people living nearby happier and healthier. As in real life, safety first is a good mantra in City Skylines too. So you'll want various fire and rescue services, just adding a firehouse reduces the likelihood of a blaze in the neighborhood. Same with police stations. Build them and send patrols out onto the streets to cut crime. So another improvement with um, at least the basic city services, health, fire, police, is they, you no longer have to place a hundred of them in your city to cover the entire city. You can actually just build like a clinic or a small police station or a small fire station and it has a greater service area obviously it is affected by you know financing and money however much money you give it is how much it works but um, and you can now designate a service to only perform in a given district if that's what you want or if you want one station to service multiple districts um, so I thought that was a very nice solution uh, to the old problem and I'm really looking forward to that Communications is a new city service in City Skylines too, helping you meet more essential needs. That oh yeah, so they Im they input uh, internet basically. So we gotta have telecommunications towers, uh, which is gonna be great. That's gonna improve happiness, um, and it's got. You'll probably see it a little bit later, but it's got like a stacking effect. So one tower may provide a general buff in the immediate vicinity. But let's say you put another tower at, let's say, the end of the range of that first tower so that the edge of the ranges are like just touching and just overlapping. You don't just get a singular bonus. You actually get a magnified bonus because there's two towers and they're within distance of each other. So they magnify their effective area, uh, kind of like uh, parks and stuff did with their happiness back in City Skylines 1, so I really like that. That includes the internet. Naturally, the easier it is to connect to the web, the happier everyone will feel and the more profitable the city's businesses will be. Of course, everyone relies on electricity, so you want to avoid long outages. They aren't just aggravating. Blackouts will prompt people to move out and force businesses to pause production, putting profits at risk keep electricity lines humming with sustainable energy sources like wind, solar, geothermal, and hydropower. 
go old school with fossil fuels like coal and gas. There's always the nuclear option too. This is the So with electricity too, big improvement. Um, you now have to have, or you now have the option to have, and I, I think at some point you need to have them to relay enough power to a certain grid, um, but you have like transformer units or uh, substations, sorry. So you have to have substations for, you know, your, your larger segments of your city to make sure that segment gets enough power and that transformer can send a main line out of the city so that you can export your extra power or you can import power if you need it. And I really like that. That's kind of a Sims 4 or SimCity 4 vibe. Most realistic city builder ever. So you'll need to deal with a whole lot of sh stuff. We're talking sewage. Gross? Yes. Necessary? Also, yes. With a wastewater treatment plant, you can purify sewage and circulate water into your city's freshwater network. Or you can pump sewage into open waters and out of the network. Don't forget to stay on top of garbage. Garbage processing centers, landfills, and an incineration plant will stop it piling up. But don't take shortcuts. Air and water pollution can sink land values, harm the health of residents, and tarnish the city's appeal to tourists. Ready to introduce a city service? Previously, you only had to construct a city service building. When that service needed to cover a larger area or support more people, you simply constructed the same building again. Not anymore. Almost all city services can now be upgraded to scale operations and expand functionality. While city services make your city livable, they come at a cost. Balancing these costs. All right, so you're seeing here the, the budget or the services panel. So as you can tell, things look a lot more expensive. So that's the change in the monetary, how, how money works in City of Skylines 2. Things will cost more than they did in City of Skylines 1, but you're also making more. So it's a little more, shall we say, realistic, um, which I really like. I don't particularly care for, um, I can't remember where it is in one section. Yeah, it's like th right here is a monthly balance and then down in the bottom right here You see it's giving you money per hour. I'd like them to be the same metric personally um, I don't know. Maybe maybe you would like that leave a comment. Let me know But I'd personally like them to all be either monthly income or daily income or something And the very real needs of everyone in your city is the name of the game Subscribe to this all right, we're on episode six of the feature highlights, electricity and water. Let's dig in. To understand the basic needs of your citizens, you need only look in the mirror. Like you and me, there are a few important things they need to live healthy, happy lives. That includes electricity, water, and sanitation. With these systems in place, everyone in your city has a shot at living their best life. Let's take a look at electricity. When laying roads, you also install low voltage underground cables that supply electricity to homes, offices, and shops. Again, just like the plumbing being below the road, I love this feature, thank you. These cables plug into transformer stations. Transformer stations are also connected to the high voltage power lines streaming from your city's power plants. They act as a junction where low voltage cables and high voltage lines link up. Together, they form the grid that pumps electricity right across your city. There's one drawback. Power lines and electric cables can only carry so much electricity. When demand increases, they can max out. I guess that's where I was talking about. You gotta have enough substations to carry uh, a load for your city. So in this instance, you see the, the center island doesn't have enough electricity when it peaks to service the entire island. So it's very likely that that island needs its own substation. Or if it's got one, it doesn't have enough, it needs a second one. So you, you, you'll have to manage your electricity a little bit more finely, but I actually like that feature. Creating a bottleneck keep the grid humming by evenly spreading electricity connections around your city. 
You can also build power lines to import electricity from neighboring cities. Imported energy will save your bacon if local power plants fail to produce enough electricity when demand increases. It will, too. Expect spikes when the thermostat drops and everyone dials up their heaters. Hot weather will cause spikes, too, as people flick on air conditioners, fans, and ice machines at the same time. Your power plants might produce more electricity than your city needs. When that happens, you can export it to your neighbors. While this can offset production costs, think it through. By storing excess electricity in emergency battery stations, you have nothing to worry about when demand rises. Emergency battery stations help your city get the most out of solar power plants. Battery I love the idea of having battery backup power. Uh, I really felt that was missing in City Skylines 1. Um, and also what helps with that is what they mentioned earlier and what I mentioned last video is the importing power from another city. So if you lose power, you would just immediately start importing power. That way you don't necessarily, you just have a temporary brownout, but then you know the buying power comes in and gets your city back up and gives you time in real time to fix the problem without having to pause the game. That's what I felt I had to do too much in City Skylines 1 was pause the game because I broke the entire game by deleting a, a critical power line or something. So uh, I like I like battery backup and I like importing power. For plants, battery stations power the city at night when the plant isn't producing electricity and recharge when they operate during the day. Of course, solar is just one renewable energy source. You can build wind, water, and geothermal power plants, too. Fossil fuels are another way to power your city. Or you can go nuclear. Let's talk water and sanitation. Surface water sources are the same as in city skylines. Expect flowing rivers, glittering lakes, and vast, swirling oceans. Groundwater is different. These underground reservoirs replenish over time, so they can run dry if they're drained at a faster rate than they're refilled. They're also susceptible to ground pollution. When they're contaminated, dirty water is pumped into your city's freshwater system. That's bad on every level, mainly because decontamination takes a long time. Build a groundwater pumping station to tap this resource and a water pumping station to bring surface water into your city's water system. You can also add water to the system with wastewater treatment plants. These plants can process sewage to produce clean water for homes and businesses. There's another way to manage sewage, sewage outlets. They release waste into open water, which can help. Yeah, and I'm sure everybody here knows the golden rule to pull in upstream and dump out downstream because <laughs> you don't want to be drinking poo water. Prevent sewage from backing up. And that's a must when it comes to public health. Bungling waste management can make people seriously ill. Yeah, and you see here, um, I think, I think this is the main facility. I think they've actually got two buildings. Um, so they've got two wastewater treatment plants because it looks like the same building. But see, this one's got an added module, and then it's probably got a second one, and then this one's got one added to it. So that's what I was talking about earlier um, with being able to upgrade to add extra modules and extra capacity and stuff. So again, like that feature. That's why you want to keep sewage outlets well away from pumping stations. How can you balance the very human needs of citizens with your ambition as a city builder? It's simple. Imagine living your life down there, day in and day out. All right, we're on episode seven of Feature Highlights, uh, Maps and Themes. Let's get going. It's easy to forget how much our day-to-day -day is shaped by where we live, but how our world looks, feels, and changes sets the scene for our lived experience. It's the same for the people in your city. And in City Skylines too. The world is a whole lot bigger. You can now build on an area five times bigger than before, equivalent to 159 square kilometers. That's bigger than some countries. All right, yeah, so comparatively, in City Skylines 1, you started with, what, nine squares, I think? Um, 
So equivalently, I'd say you're you're starting. Somebody did the. I think it was City Planner plays uh, that I saw did the did the breakdown. So pretty much your original starting area is everything minus these two blocks on the outer edge. So in City Skylines one, you would have started with this if you did nine blocks, and that was that was your max. So now you've got a little extra area to work with, and as you can see, they've made all the tiles smaller. Uh, and that's so you can unlock them more incrementally. And, you know, in, in the beginning, if you need to run to the edge of the map to import power or something, you can do that relatively easily. And I do kind of like this as a general, um, general concept. I still would like to see even bigger maps, but maybe somebody will mod that in. We'll see. If you want, if you like that part of the feature, comment down below. Let me know. Maps are composed of individual tiles. Connect them to create a sweeping urban jungle, or don't connect them to develop interesting little pockets of life. You can unlock 441 tiles on each map, but you'll have nine to work with when you begin your city building. Reach milestones to unlock more. When you do, choose tiles that best serve your expansion plans. Before you click... You see, these are all the milestones now. So before, uh, they only had, I don't know, maybe eight to 12 updates. Now we're, we've almost, almost doubled that. Um, and you get, as you can see, money at each one. Uh, you get development points at each one, and I think they'll show that a little bit later. And you get, I think the green ones are these map tiles. So at Grand Village, you can unlock six map tiles. So like I said, early game, it's really easy if you need to run to the edge of the map to get power you have six tiles so chances are you're only within you know eight or ten tiles from the edge of the map at any given place so because you do start in the middle of the you know the map so by the time i think you get to large village you can go to the end of the map if that's what you absolutely need to do in the beginning of the game but i think it it lets you open areas where you need to open areas and not open a giant square to just get one little sliver of an island or something um, because that's what you need. So I can't count how many, I can count on, you know, one hand how many times I had to do that in City Skylines 1, had to buy a tile just to, you know, get a tiny section. So I do like this improvement to the map your expansion plans. Before you click, preview the total buildable area, what natural resources are available, and the cost of that tile. The expanded map inspires you to think big, but remember to think up. Height limits have increased too, freeing you to carve a city higher in the sky than ever before. Building on this scale also invites you to think outside of the box, literally. Create connections to cities beyond the edge of your map to open up trade routes that can accelerate your city's growth. Before you select a map, look at where it sits on the globe. Is it north? Okay, so as you see here, so they didn't have these on the last video we looked at that showed the maps. So San Francisco and Temp Tempery or Temper, uh, those two maps are they'll come with your deluxe edition if you bought the game early I think so um, the rest of us will have to play on one of the other maps north or south of the equator and which hemisphere is it in check out how much of the map can be built on which natural resources it has yeah I really like that I like the new models for all the resources um, and even when you're unlocking the map tiles, the little small tiles, it, it tells you, I believe on there, what you're unlocking with that tile. If you're unlocking iron, or I mean coal, or uh, metal, or, or uh, oil, it tells you 
which I really like. And what, if any, connections already exist to neighboring cities? Found a map you like? Click and give your city a name. This is also your chance to change the default theme if you want to. There are two themes, European and North American. Themes shape the look and feel of your city, from street markings to cop cars. The biggest all right, we'll do a contest on all these videos, um, these three videos I'm going to be making to cover the feature highlights. Uh, if you want to leave a comment with a city name, uh, I'll, I'll try to pick a, a recommended city name out of the comments when we do our first playthrough, all right? So, um, and I'll give you a shout out in a video if I pick yours. So leave a comment with a city name and we'll see if I select yours difference is the architectural style of residential and commercial buildings. You can add buildings from the other theme when zoning your city. This lets you pepper European buildings in your North American city, and vice versa. Still, the theme you choose dominates the appearance of your city, and it can't be changed later. There are 10 maps in the base game, each drawing inspiration from real-world locations. You might even recognize them. And with the vast area available on the new expanded maps, terrains are more varied, resources are more accessible, and there are more ways to connect to other cities. You'll discover maps where life is lived on the sandy beaches of a sprawling archipelago, maps that invite you to build at high altitudes with a mountainside map, or along the winding waters of a rich river delta. There might even be a map that looks like the world outside your window. Select the map that stirs your imagination to set the stage for life and living in the city of your dreams. All right, we're on episode eight of the feature highlights, climate and seasons. Let's get into it. Life in a thriving city can be a whirlwind. Sunny moments of joy and laughter can cloud over as stormier times roll in. It's impossible to forecast. Luckily, the weather in your city will be more predictable as each map has a unique climate with reliable seasonal patterns. Maps in City Skylines 2 are inspired by real-world locations, so your city's climate will be unique to that place. The climate dictates how each of the four seasons looks and feels. As one season gives way to the next, the length of the day will change. The amount of sunshine and cloud cover will too. Temperatures will vary, and so will precipitation. In, in general, I just love that. I love it, it's taking from reality you know in certain hemispheres there's more daylight like in Alaska there's almost no daylight or there's one day of the year where it's only daylight so I love the new seasons features why is this so important well weather will impact your city in different ways rainy snowy and sun soaked days can pile pressure on your electricity grid same for city services which will need to respond like in winter, road maintenance crews power up plows to clear the road network of snow before it causes collisions. If I'm sorry, but I love that. All the grass, as you can see in the cars, they're getting snow on them. That's just a level of detail that I love it. Absolutely love it. If city services don't respond in time or do what needs to be done, accident rates can rise with the knock-on effect of overstretching emergency crews. Seasonal weather also affects how people move around your city and where they spend their time. Parks will draw crowds when the sun is out, while restaurants, movie theaters, and other indoor spots will get busy fast when it rains. Of course, extreme seasonal weather can turn life upside down in a flash. You can help your city prepare for natural disasters with disaster control systems, but there's no stopping them. Your city might experience disasters with a lowercase d, that's when disasters cause traffic accidents that clog road networks. Disasters with a capital D are a whole lot more serious. They All right, so I don't know about you. I want to take a poll. Comment, let me know down in the description and stuff. I never played with disasters on, mainly because I never wanted to see my city destroyed. Um... But let me know, do you play with Disasters On? Uh, do you want to see me play with Disasters On on our first city? Um, leave a comment, let me know. They impact city services and the local economy in the short and long term. 
As a city builder, it's up to you to help your city bounce back when nature is a bit extra. But for the most part, seasonal changes will be predictable. Winter will run its course and give way to spring, just as night will follow day. The day and night cycle connects to the calendar. When a day-night cycle ends, one calendar month will have passed. So every 24 hours, a month of the year will have come and gone. The seasons will change after three cycles. And after 12 cycles, it's time to start all over again. The citizens of your city will experience life's highs and lows like the shifting seasons. Good times and bad will come and go. By building your city's unique climate, you can create the backdrop for life lived to its fullest. Thank you for joining us today. That was episode four through eight. Our next video is going to be episodes nine through 13 to finish out the series. Um, please like and subscribe if you feel I've earned it. And we'll see you in the next one.